Welcome, everybody, to a special edition of the Book Club, which will today be about Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance. And we are joined by philosopher and chess grandmaster and previous guest on Rebel Wisdom, Jonathan Rousen. Jonathan, welcome. Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining this evening. We'll come to questions for the last sort of 25 minutes or so of the call. I was really pleased that you chose this book, Jonathan. It's a book that had a huge impact on me and was probably one of the, 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 the books that had the most effect on me then going and I, I went and studied philosophy at, at university. So I'd love to ask you what made you chose, choose this book and what does it, yeah, what does it say to you? Well, thank you. And it's, real, it's a real privilege. I mean, it could hardly be better than to be asked to talk about this book, to be honest. It's, um, that said, I hadn't thought about it until the issue came up. So I thought about it three months ago when David first said, you know, you have a book, anything comes to mind you want to talk about? I suddenly thought, yeah, Zen and the Art of, and the art of Motorcycle Maintenance. Um, and of course, at that point, I was like, okay, where is that book in the house? And for the last three months, more or less, I've been looking for it. Um, and then about two weeks ago, when I thought, okay, this is getting ridiculous, I really can't find it, um, I I ordered a new one. And I'm glad I did, because it's the it was the 25th anniversary edition, and it had new material from Persig at the front, including correspondence with his publisher then uh, at the back. So I learned a great deal more about it. Um, the book got into my soul uh, relatively late compared to you, David. I, I actually bought it when I was an undergraduate at Oxford. I was, actually, I was actually studying philosophy at the time. And I was pretty good at it. You know, I got it, I got good marks in the end and I, you know, I was quite able with philosophy. But to be honest, I couldn't follow this book. I, I tried to a few times. I, I don't know whether what I couldn't follow was actually the philosophy or it was, it was the fact that it was combined with so much narrative exposition, so much kind of existential crisis. So I'm going to assume talking to the Rebel Wisdom crowd that you have some semblance of awareness, but do disabuse me of that notion if you haven't. Can anyone here who has not read the book and knows nothing about it, uh, let me know now, please, by putting a virtual hand up or hand, okay. So a little bit of introduction is in order, maybe about 10% or so of people. Okay, so from first principles then, this is a book about a sort of early middle-aged man um, getting on a motorcycle with his 11-year-old son and traveling around the U.S. Um, if I remember, remember rightly, he goes from um, somewhere on the East Coast, I forget exactly where, all the way to San Francisco. And um, in that time, he stops off en route. And every time he stops off, he, does, he gives a lecture effectively, but he calls it by a more traditional name, uh, a Chautauqua, which is a weird spelling, not really phonetic, um, but it's an old fashioned educational movement term to get to the idea of somebody who would show up or a group of people who would show up in a community and share something of great importance. So, each, so the, the structure of the book is long road trip with son giving a lecture every time he stops off, right? Now, that doesn't sound too remarkable, but there's more going on. There's another relationship in the book, which is between Persig and Phaedrus. And Phaedrus is um, kind of Persig's alter ego, or rather it's the Persig who was committed to a lunatic asylum and given electroconvulsive shock therapy and very nearly lobotomized only because of some civil liberty groups that were around at the time did the judge apparently lessen his sentence. Uh, such was the sort of um, basic mental health care of the time that Persig nearly didn't exist long enough in his, in his form to write a book like this. And he gets out of there and he reestablishes his life. But in the process, he's, there's a kind of schism. So in connection to the original, well, one of the meanings of schizophrenia um, there's a kind of two people here. And it's not the only meaning of schizophrenia, I should say, I know from personal experience and I've shared this publicly. So one of the reasons this book's so important to me is that my own father is schizophrenic. And this is a key feature of the book. Um, my brother also, but in a somewhat different manifestation. So encounters with madness in the family is very close to my heart. And I've written about this elsewhere and it's, it's kind of another story, but it was one of the reasons that I was at least intuitively very drawn to this this motorcycle ride between a man and his son, because one of the subtexts of the story is that Chris, his son, is a bit suspicious of his father. He feels his father has sort of disappeared. 
Um, and later in the book, we realized there's a kind of almost a competition going on between who's really telling the story here. Is it the kind of narrator, Robert Persig, or is, it, is this prior character called Fidrus who was committed to an asylum? And there's a kind of emotional climax in that part of the book where Chris asks his father, um, were you really mad? And his father says, no. Um, and there's a kind of emotional crystallization. And they have previously been wearing their helmets on the motorcycle. They take the helmets off. They have a great time. It's, it's lovely at that level. So there's a kind of emotional back, back story here. So Persig's relationship with the son, Persig's relationship with himself, and then Persig's relationship with two companions on the ride. Um, uh, John is the, the main character who features a kind of, he's a kind of technophobe. Um, they're, they're basically hippies. And they are, they're very reluctant to fix their motorcycles. So the, the title is Zen and the Arch of Motorcycle Maintenance is something to do with the desire to uh, encounter reality through attentiveness to what you're involved in, whether that's a motorcycle, nature, a mountain, anywhere else. So Ritlar, that's the kind of, for those who don't know the story, what's going on. And when he stops to give the lectures, what he's really talking about are partly his own experiences of university institutions. So partly his experience of teaching young children, partly his, his experience of, of encountering other faculty members, his attempts to apply for things and being rejected. And throughout all of that, he's sort of critiquing an underlying view of rationality. And the philosophical heart of the book is what person, the idea of what person calls quality. Now, quality is a natural language English term. So uh, in one way, you might think, what's so exciting about that? But it's really quite profound. The more you get into the book, the more person keeps on asking, what is quality? Um, and the reason he does that is that he believes that we have a kind of primal aesthetic perception of the world, a, a, a very fundamental sense of, of what's good and what's not good. Indeed, the book begins with a quotation, um, what is good fighters and what is not good? Need we ask anyone to tell us these things? And the whole, the whole sort of inquiry is about this inquiry into what is good and what isn't, and how do we know? And the reason I picked it now as well is that as an adult who now is a 12 year old son of my own, so has some sense of it from the other side. Um, I also have a bit more philosophical education. So I've, I've come across, for instance, Matthew Crawford's work on paying attention and Ian McGilchrist's work on two fundamental different, different, fundamentally different patterns of attention. And I can say that I think Persig's philosophical contribution is really profound and it was kind of ahead of its time in some ways. Um, and I think the last thing to say for this first question is that it's spiritually deep. You know, it's it's um, it's about. I will, I always got confused when studying philosophy about on the one hand this love of wisdom, this supposed love of wisdom, which is a kind of yearning to be, you know to belong to the cosmos, a kind of who am I search. On the other hand, you end up writing essays about logic and language and uh, you know the strength of an epistemic knowledge claim and what's truth and things like that. Um, but actually what Persig's book reveals, and I think what is true more generally, is that it's when you get to the limits of logic and language, when you get to the limits of reason, that this kind of aporia opens up, this kind of experience of uncertainty and unknowing. And there's a lot of that in the book. And there's actually, just to give you a sense of the depth of it, um, the reason the book is so beautiful, I think it ultimately did so well, is that it combines these different threads, the relationship with the sun, the relationship with the self, the commentary on the culture at the time, um, and Persig's own grappling with his sanity, and then the spiritual search. Persig spent a lot of time in Korea, some time in India. So he had this kind of awareness of Vedanta, awareness of Buddhism. And so he's grappling the whole time, East and West. And he's also grappling with a fundamental distinction he calls classical and romantic understanding. So he's trying to get at the fact, this is very alive today. And I don't know why Facebook's dying, but it could be lots of reasons. But we live in a very uh, technologically intensive age. Some call it an algorithmic society. We live in a time when half of the time we're alienated from what's around us. I mean, I kind of know how Zoom works, although as you saw, we had some glitches. But nonetheless, I don't really know. You know, I can't really fit, fathom how this was made possible. Um, in, in every detail. And likewise, most of us are surrounded by gadgets and gizmos and devices that 
We know how to work, maybe, but we don't really understand. And because we don't understand them, we don't really know how to fix. So when Persig talks about Zen and the art of motorcycle maintenance, he means Zen in the sense of getting the right relationship to reality. It's quite a decent shorthand for Zen, getting the right relationship to reality. Um, and the motorcycle is a metaphor for, for almost anything. It just happens to be the proximate thing that Persig is dealing with. But what he was trying to get away from at the time was a kind the, the notion that spiritual life was all about kind of uh, leaving the machines behind and going back to nature. Persig saying no. He says you can encounter the Buddha inside the motorcycle just as much as you can encounter it, you know, on the mountaintop. And this is this is very crucial for understanding our present age. This need to rebalance the kind of technological overdrive with the kind of naturalistic and classical forms of life. Um, so I'm going to read a little passage here, which for me was the kind of climax of the book. Um, it's a moment where person keeps on asking this question, what is quality? What is quality? And when I was younger, you know, the first time I read the book, I couldn't really get why he cared. You know, it wasn't obvious to me what was at stake here. But as you get into it a little more, you see that what he's really getting at is something a bit like what they talk about in Advaita Vedanta or the non-dual tradition. In other words, the gap between the subject and the object, between the experiencing subject and the world outside, and sort of sensing into the fact that this is a kind of illusion, that really there is no division somehow. And yet rendering that in natural language and making sense of it is very difficult. So there's a moment where it's not clear if he's going mad or becoming enlightened. Um, and it's I'll just read it to you to give you a sense of it. I remember reading this and being just kind of knocked away, just kind of you know, silenced really for some time and, and, be, and just very, very impressed. So it goes like this. Um, I mean, there's a big lead up to it. And he talks about rediscovering the Tao Te Ching, for example. He finds the Tao Te Ching. He reckons with the Tao. He realizes that what is the Tao? And they keep talking about, you know, the Tao that can be named is not the real Tao. Likewise, quality that can be defined is not the real quality because somehow it's prior to all of that. So there's something deep going on here. And he, he comes to grapple with, oh my goodness, all this time what I've been talking about and struggling with is this fundamental spiritual insight. He says this, He's reading from the Tao Te, Ching, Tao Te Ching and he's interposing his own word quality on the Tao. And he goes like this. Fibrous read on through line after line, verse after verse of this. He watched the match fit, slip into place exactly. This is what he meant. This was what he'd been saying all along, only poorly and mechanistically. There was nothing vague or inexact about this book. It was, this is the Tao Te Ching. It was as precise and definite as it could be. It was what he had been saying, only in a different language with different roots and origins. He was from another valley seeing what was in this valley, not now as a story told by strangers, but as a part of the valley he was from. He was seeing it all. He had broken the code. He read on line after line, page after page, not a discrepancy. What he had been talking about all the time as quality was here as Tao, the great central generating force of all religions oriental and occidental, past and present, all knowledge, everything. Then his mind's eye looked up and caught his own image and realized where he was and what he was seeing. And I don't know what really happened, but now the slippage that Phaedrus had felt earlier, the internal parting of his mind suddenly gathered momentum as do the rocks at the top of a mountain. Before he could stop it, the sudden accumulated mass of awareness began to grow and grow into an avalanche of thought and awareness out of control, with each additional growth of the downward tearing mass loosening hundreds of times its volume, and then that mass uprooting hundreds of times of volume more, and then hundreds of times of that, on and on, wider and broader, until there was nothing left to stand. No more anything. It all gave way from under him. And that's the end of chapter 20. And that's about halfway through the book. So this is Phaedrus kind of at once kind of collapsing and yet sort of seeing at the same time. And the rest of the book, he's kind of catching up with that insight and trying to make sense of it. Um, so I love the book for lots of reasons, because it's personal to me, because it formed my childhood. There was a moment when um, I, I wrote about this and shared it earlier today. When Persig died, my wife texted me just to say he died. And I remember stopping in my tracks and feeling tearful because just he, he was a big part of my formation. It wasn't as though I read the book every day or anything like that, 
But this sense of grappling with getting the right relationship to reality has lived on. And I'd also say it's informed my professional life. I now run an organization called Perspectiva. And one of the reasons for that is I got tired of the language of systems change. I just felt people didn't really know what they were talking about because systems have emotions and, and souls and epistemologies and they're full of interiority, right? So the limits of speaking of the system, the economic system and political system and so forth, is that inside all of them, you have this interiority, this experience. And Persig is brilliant at making sense of why that matters. It's that insight is right at the heart of the culture war. And when Persig, the reason I said I was glad to have the 25th edition is in the beginning, he tries to explain what made the book so valuable. And he called, he uses a Swedish term actually, which is like culture bearer, basically culture bearer. Um, and he says that this book held the cultural tension of the time. Now it was published in, I think, 74. The road trip was meant to be in 68, but it was all about grappling with the 60s counterculture and what came next. Um, and all about the tension between hip and square that I mentioned. And today it still lives on, this, ten, this sort of tension between technological society and the kind of romantic classical society and love of nature and so forth. It's all part of the same world and Persig saw that beautifully and deeply. And that's why it's such a great book because he didn't see it all at once. It was hard earned and beautifully shared. So that's why I love it. Mm. Thank you, Jonathan. That was a beautiful summary of the book. And as someone said in the chat, a wonderful summary of the various layers of the book. Um, I wonder whether you know, so I, I reread it also. I was on holiday in Greece earlier this, this month, last month, and I reread it and I was struck by, and I, I must have had the same version because it talked about sort of the, um, a bit more about his biography and how the book I think was rejected 120 times before it was yeah. Yeah. accepted, which is just amazing. But the, but the, the publisher who accepted it said this is this is an astonishing book this is going to change the world and kind of predicted the how 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 um yes and not no quite. not quite it's interesting you say that because it's partly true and every i sorry to interrupt you but it, it's important mm. to get it right because actually in this edition i have for the first time i read the correspondence between persick and his editor mm. basically it was a long exchange like un, un, unheard of almost in publishing that the writer expresses it, you know, this is what the book's about. The, the, the editor says, we might be interested, send us more. They read the book. And then there was this long protracted inquiry into, you know, how on earth this book would sell because it was so hard to pin down. It wasn't clear who it was for. It wasn't clear what it was. It didn't fit a genre. It wasn't clear how to market it. And in the end, he had to work really hard to convince the other people in the publishing house to that it, that it was viable. And he paid Persig the basic advance at the time, which was $3,000. Um, and luckily, Persig got a royalty uh, basis because otherwise he'd missed out on a lot of, I think it sold many millions thereafter and 23 languages, translations, something like that. Um, but it, it, it was true that the publisher, you're right in the sense that the publisher sensed it was brilliant and sensed that if, if it worked, then it would be transformative. And that was indeed the case. Mm. Well, I think, yeah, I think I read a summary of, of it. And there was a sort of six year process of it being written and rewritten, I think, from when so, he first, yeah, from, from that is, early. I mean, I find this beautiful. If any of you are still interested after this talk and we haven't put you off Persig for life, um, there's an NPR interview around the time the book has already been accepted for publication, but has not yet gone public. And it's, you'll find it on YouTube, just put NPR Persig and you'll find it. Um, and it speaks about the writing process. And two things I find extraordinary about this. One is that the last six chapters, when the book kind of really comes alight in some ways and really is at its most luminous, he writes in complete isolation. He hires a camper van, gets away from it all, and goes to this holiday camp where you're allowed to have a camper van, but it hasn't even opened yet. So he just stays there, tends to himself, and writes day after day after day. But before that, the real grind is when he was actually working as a, a technical writer, writing manuals for computers. Um, so he's always been a bit, you know, square in his own terms, um, but he was always struggling to explain why it mattered and why it wasn't just, he wasn't lost in that, why it had broader meaning. But when he wrote the first part of the book, he would get up at 2 a.m. every day for years, and he would go to a place quite close to his work, 
and he'd work, he'd write and write and write. And then he'd, he'd head into work about six hours later. He'd work normally, he'd have an hour's nap at lunch. He'd finish his afternoon shift at four hours. Then he'd go home and he'd conk out about 6 p.m. And then he'd wake up again at 2, 2 a.m. and he'd do it over again. I mean, that's commitment, right? And he said he could do that because he was just compelled to write the book. It came through him. And most authors say there's something similar that when the diamond gets you, it's just, you know, overtakes you. So. Yeah, I'm, I'm fascinated by the, um, I, I guess when I first read it, it, it I didn't realize like how much of it was true. And I, I started Googling it to find out like how much was, was actually the case from his own life. I guess you know a little bit more about his biography and it, it like it's it's essentially autobiographical and there's also a few sort of really tragic codas to the book because um the the, the son in the book unfortunately was killed age 22 in in a kind of bizarre I think it was an attempt of mugging outside the Buddhist center in San Francisco or something yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. astonishing um and he was obviously marked by tragedy in so many different areas of his life he's a very troubled man in some ways what do you yeah what do you make of that the biography and the the, the man behind the book well um he lived at 88 so that's not bad going um he um so the question of to what extent he was mentally ill i can't really answer i wasn't you know around him at the time um i think he comes across as a sort of mild-mannered hyper intellectual he doesn't seem to be he seems quite agreeable in every conversation I've seen him be part of in all of his correspondence. I don't sense um, a particularly strong um, desire to impose his will on the world, but I do sense somebody who's who's desperate to convey his insight. Um, and I think some of his relationships were difficult because um, the tension between Phaedrus and, and Persig is very interesting because Phaedrus was this kind of um, hyper analytical, forget everything else, just get to the truth of the matter analytically. Le even if that leads you down a rabbit hole, and what, what Persig thought was that you somehow could get to an axiomatic truth. A lot of people feel this way when they enter university, that somehow you'll study, you know, fundamental maths, or you'll study physics, or even philosophy, and you'll get to some bedrock, you know, some kind of axioms upon which you can build your entire life and identity. And at some stage you realize you can't, right? Um, and first it got to that point, and, but Phaedrus was somehow always in that mode. And what was interesting is that that was his most authentic self. The, the person that was on intellectual stilts, who couldn't really be understood by most people, was somehow his truest self. But through the process of being committed to a mental institution, nearly being lobotomized, receiving electroconvulsive therapy, breaking down completely, and then rebuilding his life, he pragmatically thought, I don't want to go back there. And yet Chris, one of the tensions in the book, Chris can sense this is not his real father, that somehow he's disappeared. Um, and what's really beautiful is that in the latter editions of, of Zen, like 25 years uh, later, they actually changed the font in the last chapter to reflect the fact that this is now Phaedrus speaking. In other words, Persik says there was a mistake in comprehension that he puts down to his own failure, although obviously it's not a failure for selling millions and people are loving it. But he says that people understood that somehow Phaedrus had been pacified and, and taken control of. That's not the case. Phaedrus was never really the problem. The society that thought he was sick was the problem. I mean, it's complicated. You know, mental illness is very complicated, politically and morally vexed. I know that better than anyone. But nonetheless, in the case of Phaedrus, what's really happened is Chris is recognizing his father again. He's come back into the kind of driving seat of the personality but in a more integrated way now, because Persig is over, is older, um, he's a bit more on top of things, and it's safer now somehow for Phaedrus to be back and sort of in charge of the self, as it were. Um, and then as a guy, you know, he was a bit of a recluse. He's kind of at once a hermit and a heretic and an outsider. Um, he's all of these things. But I do sense he, he responded very well to being approached by the right people. You know, he... If people were genuinely curious about his work, then uh, he was very forthcoming over this time when he wasn't writing a book. Um, only exception to that is he had a weird conversation with Julian uh, Bagini, the sort of British philosopher, popular philosopher, very you know successful, sold a lot of books and very influential in the philosophy scene here. 
they have a weird correspondence where Bajini, to his credit, is trying to understand what Percy is trying to say. And they reach some kind of limitation. They just can't see each other. Uh, Bajini is asking for definitions. Percy refuses to give them. Bajini says, well, how can we continue the conversation? Persik says, you haven't really engaged with my work properly. And it kind of just doesn't really work. Um, so that was the only time I felt maybe Persik could have been a bit more um, congenial and perhaps more, more accommodating. But in general, he strikes me as someone who was extremely intelligent, almost too intelligent for his own good, um, came up upon a society that didn't fully understand what he was trying to do, he got frustrated by that had some difficult relationships as we all do, and um, but nonetheless lived a life of great value. What format was that conversation you mentioned with Julian Pagini? I believe it was in a, a, a book of, a sort of anthology of conversations with philosophers originally, but it's probably online. In fact, I'm pretty sure it is online. You can find it. Um, I mean, my memory was not very clear, but that was the gist of it, what I took away. Mm. No, I just wonder whether it was a, a of audio conversation or whether it was written. Uh, I think it was written, yeah. Um, yeah, there's a kind of um, almost like J.D. Salinger quality to him, a sort of like slightly mysterious, slightly kind of detached figure who was maybe a little bit ahead of, the, ahead of his time. And um, yeah, the sort of sense of kind of alienation, which, yeah, I, I wonder, the question that comes up is like, what, what do you see his influ is his influence on the culture? What do you see as sort of like authors that are influenced by him or, um, yeah, what, what impact do you think, if you can look back and see, do you think the book had? Well, I encounter lots of people who have come upon him at one stage or the other, um, some very deeply, some just in passing. It's interesting you say alienation because in some ways the book is an antidote to alienation. It's about the world of technology building up around us. I mean, back then the problem was a, Japanese Honda, right, motorcycle. But that was an, a sort of enough of a shift and a subversive hit on the culture at the time that people could sense all oh, this technology is all coming. Now, of course, we have, you know, the smartphone is the new Axis Mundi in our hand, and it's a different world entirely. It's, you know, an algorithmic society. But we're somewhat alienated from it because we don't fully grasp how it works and how we're implicated in it. So Perstick was writing to say, look, Understand the world around you. You know, if if something if your table breaks, fix it yourself if you can. If your motorcycle doesn't sound quite right, ask yourself why that is. But he's aware that there's a whole bunch of people who don't do that, um, who would rather just outsource that issue and say that's technical, it's not my thing. Um, and then in terms of so so I say that because what's interesting is you're talking about him being alienated, and that's true. He is in some ways alienated from the culture. But in a weird way, that's because he thinks that people are alienated from themselves. Um, something, there's a whole conversation there, but that's the basic dynamic. Um, and then influence, I mean, I haven't heard, I've seen him quoted periodically. I mean, the biggest influence, I spent the summer reading Ian, Ian McGilchrist's new book, um, which Perspective are publishing in November. Uh, it's called The Matter With Things. And now Ian would probably not necessarily, wouldn't say he'd necessarily accept this analogy. And they are quite different. You know, they're different um, educations, different trainings, different four points of emphasis. They call upon different disciplines and so forth. One is a popular fiction, well, fiction-ish classic, and the other is, um, you know, sort of serious analytic philosophy. But I see a lot of Persig and McGilchrist. I see a great deal of, there are, two, there are broadly two patterns of attention we pay to the world. And they arise coextensively, simultaneously, and so much so that it's a kind of optical illusion of consciousness that we think that it's one thing. It's only when you really slow down or you really um, analyze it in the right way with the right kind of experiments that you begin to see that there are two broad patterns of attention. One is very focused and zoomed in and trying to conform things to an existing pattern of knowledge, which Persig would call... Um, classical understanding, like, like it's sort of trying to sort of see how things are. are. And the other is, although they're not, not an exact match, so I wouldn't want to say one is, the, you know, they're parallels. Um, and the other is this kind of broad vigilance of seeing context, seeing the purpose of the whole thing, seeing the particularity of something, not, not any algorithm, not as a repeated pattern, but as something unique. 
and present. And this is key for Percy because he speaks a lot about quality as this kind of prior perception of goodness that we already have, that we can sort of grasp intuitively, this is good and that's not good. And then we struggle to explain why. And he thinks, if you think about that enough, what he's talking about is something like the old Greek idea of the good, the true, and the beautiful, that this is somehow a fundamental feature of reality that we can all intuit and orient ourselves towards. And McGilchrist doesn't quite speak in this language, but he does speak about the difference between something that's present and the process of presencing, which comes from Heidegger and various other people, compared to this sort of representation, this things that are not present and not alive in their uniqueness, but are somehow repackaged and remodeled. Um, I see someone in the chat there mentioning gumption. Um, for what it's worth, um, Persick's notion of gumption traps is worth knowing about because we experience them every day. And um, gumption trap is basically where you lose your enthusiasm because of some glitch and you lose your capacity to keep the momentum of your energy and your focus and so forth. And that can be like anything from an email that bounces in that you didn't want to not being able to connect to the Wi-Fi or whatever. These are all gumption traps. And he speaks about how to build resilience to gumption traps. Um, anyway, in terms of living on the culture, it just does. I mean, people know his book, right? I mean, it still sells. Um, when I when I said today on Twitter, you know, um, where does this word uh, Chautauqua come from? You know, quite a few people said, well, it comes from Persig, of course. And uh, he did see a lot of new ideas. Ch Chautauqua's romantic and classical understanding, the whole idea of Zen Buddhism, although it was already becoming quite popular with Suzuki and various other influences, Persig did bring it into the mainstream. Um, so, yeah, it lives on. Um, but interestingly, I don't know if people talk about it that much because all said and done in the academy, he's not quite legit. And this is one of his one of his issues, right? Um, there, there has been at least one PhD in Persig's work awarded. But most analytic philosophers and most conventional high esteem university departments would not recognize it as, you know, proper philosophy somehow, which is really short-sighted and sad, I think. But it's typical of a kind of academic culture that wants to know, well, has it been, in what way has it been peer-reviewed and so forth? You will, of course, find more enlightened teachers who bring it to bear. But by the way, his, his I should just say, it lives on in the second book, Lila, um, in that th there is a whole community online about the metaphysics of quality, which is, a deeper look at his philosophy, a whole metaphysical system. That's kind of the, um, what do you call that thing? The, the great chain of being, but reconceived by Persig under his under the aspect of his idea of quality. So um, it lives on philosophically, I think culturally in this, this desire, that, you know, this Snow lecture on the two cultures preceded Persig, I think, but that, that's what he's speaking to. And um, this idea of the divide between the techies and the kind of uh, the non-techies, the, the hum humanities students or this, you know, that lives on today. A lot of the fights in the kind of university culture wars are about um, the humanities and social sciences somehow not understanding the hard sciences. That's a kind of echo of the problems Persig was grappling with. And just before we come to the the questions and there's some great questions in the in the document so please do go there and add your initials to the ones that you particularly like and we'll we'll come to those shortly but on the on the topic of quality um i just wonder it's got two sort of related questions is the is the significance there that it kind of collapses the subject object like subject object division so it sort of like cuts a little bit through the sort of western philosophical quandary or the western sort of dilemma and also the the your um organization perspectiva is highly influenced by developmental thinking and i'm sure a lot of people on the call will be familiar with kind of ken wilber robert keegan and all this kind of idea of developmental thinking and is there a relation between that and quality do you think that that um yeah there's a sort of intrinsic upness to the world or a sort of directionality to the world it's a good question, um, and it's a difficult one. I'm, I'm in a phase of, I mean, I, it's true that developmental thinking has been important to Perspectiva and to my own 
you know, intellectual formation for what that's worth. I did spend, I was a student at Keegan's class at Harvard. And, you know, after, after that, you never see the world in quite the same way again. I've read a great deal of Ken Wilber. I've read in enough kind of cultural tribes who throw around spiral dynamics colors, you know, and, you know, I kind of understand that language. I also read some Piaget, so the first principles of it. So I'm not, I'm not someone who says development doesn't matter. It does. It's real. And yet, um, what exactly it is, is a sort of different question. I think to really understand development, you've got to see it as a kind of open systems biology. And by that, I mean, it's about the nature of life as such. As such, any kind of open system, learning over time to, um, you know, in Piaget's language, assimilate and accommodate, but basically it's how you open and close yourself to what's around you and what you can, what you're subject to and what you can take as object. Now, there's, it hasn't escaped my attention that Keegan's subject-object relationship and Persig's subject-object metaphysics might have some connection. And for a while, I even began drafting something about that. Um, I think the way to understand it, though, is that Persig's actually after something different. Like I say, he's a bit more like what Rupert Spire would call the direct path. He's more about the kind of primary, perennial, fundamental perception of reality as it is without any mediating influences. It's hard to make sense of that in natural language, but he's interested in that kind of gulp of insight where you see things as they are. But of course he knows that that doesn't happen all by itself necessarily. There's a kind of building up to it, but there's nothing in person that makes me think he's talking about, you know, the socialized mind versus, versus the self-authoring mind or green versus yellow or, you know, any of that stuff. So in that sense, he's not developmental. However, his next book, Lila, um, there, it, that is a bit more developmental, but it's more about patterns of life. So he goes from sort of, inner, I forget the exact categories, but there's kind of, uh, inner, I think there's kind of biological, intellectual, and cultural. There's maybe one more. Um, and he's going through them as kind of sequences in which one is higher than the other. And he's saying that that's the way to understand what progress looks like, um, that there are higher, but, you, but the higher order forms depend upon the lower order forms too. So it's not as though they can do away with them. Um, so it's a good question. The relationship between Persig and developmental thinking I mean, one of the things that is there in development is the capacity to hold opposites and hold tensions and hold divergent views. And I think Persig does manage to do that because his whole emphasis in the first book, at least, is on the simultaneous value of classical and romantic understanding, the kind of perception of things as they appear and the perception of things in terms of how they work and operate. And a lot of people are saying it's one or the other. One or the other is more fundamental. Person is much more of a both and kind of person. And he's pushing the reader to that both and kind of insight. So again, I'm stretching a bit here, but that's how I'd see the developmental side. Mm, awesome. So I think we'll, look, we'll come to some of the questions now. Uh, Tim Stewart, I think your question is the most upvoted in the document. Sure. What, what, uh, I don't know, Dan. Let me see if I can find it. No, I'm just if you so. What, what I uh, the part that I enjoyed most was um, how uh, in his university teaching days, um, and also how he was describing quality through the lens of teaching, and 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 how he talked about um, the like the the particular students who would succeed academically but would would fail in his class versus not, and and how he would prescribe assignments and stuff. I'd, I'd love for you to, if you could talk a little bit more about like that and like use that as a way to, to speak more to what exactly quality is. Right. Great question. And um, what I've thought about a little bit and, and partly in preparation for this and partly just because I was tripping on person for a while, I came upon a, a pretty good YouTube interview um, about his work. And I think it's some, the title is something to do with partial understanding, um, but I forget, forget what it was. But anyway, I remember what they said, which was that there is a part of the book you're right in where, Persig says, we're not going to do any grades. I'm going to ask the students to tell me which of these essays are good and which are not. The students know, they seem to, can tell, they can tell this essay is good and this one isn't. And then he, he asked them to retrospectively explain why. You know, is it something to do with its length? Is it something to do with the range of vocabulary? Is it something to do with um, the, the plot lines? 
Um, is it the, is it how it looks? Like all of these things, they try and break it down. And they come to the conclusion that they can't really do it. Um, that actually there isn't really any adequate way to systematize their judgment about what's good and what's not good, that old question. Persick's view is that there's this, I think someone joked there with the a line a priori gumption. So thanks for that. I'm not sure how that fits into this, but I appreciate it anyway. But there is this kind of prior perception of, of, of quality, which is fundamentally aesthetic in nature, where you're just sensing, is this thing good? Do I like it? The aesthetic sensibility is one of taste, really. It's one of, is this, do I accept or reject this? Um, and it's um, in that context that it's a, a conundrum, an open question as to whether a person's theory applies, because if you think about it, you need a degree of expertise to perceive quality, right? If I, um, in, in the case of an essay, you need to understand the English language, but you may also need to know certain words. You may also need to have enough experience of reading stories to know what a good story feels like and what a bad one feels like. If I ask my six-year-old to look at an essay and my 12-year-old, I wouldn't be surprised if my 12-year-old made a better judgment. So although Persig might be right about this kind of fundamental perception, it's not totally clear how it relates to prior knowledge because the prior knowledge shapes the perception. Another example would be, you know, I played chess for many years professionally and I look at a position and I see a great deal in one snapshot. I can even see a beautiful move in one snapshot, but a beginner can't. Beginner sees lots of pieces and many possibilities, but they won't necessarily get to the heart of the position quickly. So there's, there's a conundrum here. And it's, to be honest, it's a critique of Persig. It's saying, how does this work exactly? We can see how, you know, you can look at something from afar and you can you have an aesthetic sense about what's good and what's not good that precedes any rational deliberation about it. We can maybe grant you that. But if that's the case, tell me how it works in cases where you need prior knowledge to perceive in the right way. And I don't know if person has been asked that, but it's the key question about his work. Awesome. And I think next is Andy Wright. I like this question. It's um, a topic that I think is really important. Right. Hello. Uh, yes, yeah, slightly long one, but I guess, yeah, the fundamental question, I guess, is there's obviously this tension between kind of nature and technology, which I think you've referenced. And obviously, I guess Persig might be, I'm not sure, but um, it would seem that obviously technology has amplified our ability to destroy and disconnect us from nature. But you obviously can't uninvent technology. So it's almost like this kind of tension, but in kind of like the, the Ken Wilber frame of, you know, kind of integrating this. I've heard it also described as two-eyed scene where you take the strengths of kind of the Western view and you take the strengths of the indigenous view. Is it kind of possible to kind of integrate these two halves? And is that related to the work that you're doing with Prospectiva? I mean, it's <clears throat> the, the fundamental conundrum you raise about technology and nature especially is really difficult <clears throat> and to be honest I don't know how I how I answer it there's a lovely it's a bit flip but there's a lovely line technology owes ecology and apology just because it, it kind of you know it has a nice ring to it technology owes ecology and apology and I think <clears throat> that might be true um, but the problem is never so much technology it's 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 the kind of mindset that technology brings with it and again this is what Persig is grappling with um, to be anti-technology, to be technophobic, is almost every bit as much of a problem as to be naively tech-utopian. Um, but so on the one hand, that's my inclination. It's like technology, in theory, is a neutral tool, right? And, and therefore, it's never good or bad in itself. It's, it's about the quality of the beings that use it. However, that's true in a kind of abstract theoretical sense. In an advanced capitalist system, I'm not so sure it's true. Because the question of technology is never so much what can it do or how cool is it, but who owns it and what do they want, right? Is their private interest aligned with the public interest? That's the technology question. Now that's not in and of the technology itself, but technological systems at scale are defined by that coercive, extractive, surveilling motive. And that's why there is a real challenge now to resist what we call technology. But when I think, you know, we think of Facebook, is it technology or is it just brute capitalism? You know, it's extracting attention and data 
um, rather than extracting fossil fuels or gold or whatever. Um, but the underlying principle is still one of, ex of extraction for profit. And it's still a kind of nature. It's extracting our attention, which is based on a neurophysiology, right? Um, so I, I want to say technology is not the problem, but in my, I'm not sure I believe it. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you, Andy. Uh, Lisa Moroski. Are you there? Yes. Yeah. Hi. Um, so thank you. Um, thank you, Jonathan, for represencing this book in my life. It was also very transformative um, at about that same age. Um, so it dawned on me while you were speaking earlier that um, Phaedrus is is kind of like um, Persig's soul, you know, and he's having a conversation with his soul in, in much the same way that Jung has a conversation with his soul in the Red Books. Do you, do you see any similarities between um, those two kind of inner dialogues and the, the underlying psychic processes that are going on? You know, the Jung canon is vast, and I, 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 I know some of it. Um, and I know that there was even a book called The Undiscovered Self, which I read some time ago. And like all of us, I remember it by how it looks. It was a silver, shiny, small book. Um, and I remember reading in there a difference between, um, you know, the, the personality and the self, or the self being somehow not really part of the ego, egoic identity, but somehow a larger notion. Um, and in that sense, maybe it connects to the world soul or the collective unconscious or, you know, there's whole conversations to be had there. In Persig's case, though, I think it's somewhat different. And, and that's because there is a pain to this relationship. The relationship between Phaedrus and Persig is, a, is, a, is not altogether benign. Um, there is a sense in which Phaedrus is, has been displaced. Um, and only towards the end of the book does he somehow reappear in this again the language is tricky here but he comes back into the egoic structure into the body into the life whereas before he was this phantom this ghost that was referred to by the narrator um and persig so there's so many layers to this right because there's persig the writer then there's the narrator of the book then there's the narrator writing about phydrus um and phydrus is within the self um as a memory, as a pattern. And it's also something he's trying to flee. So he's kind of a fugitive from Phaedrus. And yet Phaedrus is also dispossessed, literally. Like now he's just a pattern, Phaedrus, no longer in a body with a life, just a memory with a, you know, mostly bad memories. So my inclination would be saying it's not a conversation with the soul as such, but I do see why, why you would draw the parallel. And it's, a, it's an interesting one to explore. Um, I think there's something altogether anguished about the Phaedrus Persig relationship. And it only really settles when, in a weird way, Phaedrus becomes Persig. Um, or rather, vice versa, sorry. In effect, Persig becomes Phaedrus, and Phaedrus is then the person um, by the end of the book. Um, but I think not many people read it that way for several years. It was only when Persig sort of chimed in and said, Hang on, guys, you've been getting this a little bit wrong. At the end, it's actually Phaedrus who comes back. It's not that Phaedrus has been somehow assimilated and, uh, you know, dissolved. No, on the contrary, he is now the person. But it's a bit beyond me. That's intra-psychological stuff within, within Robert Persig, which he does well to convey, but who knows, you know. Zach Parsons, are you there? Yes. Yeah, yeah, I'm still here. Um, but actually, Jonathan kind of answered a little bit of my question, so I was going to modify it slightly about Persig's subsequent works. And since he had this, you know, monumental creative effort at one point in his life, and then you talked about his follow-up book, Lila, basically, did, did he, to your knowledge, spend the rest of his life just responding to this and building off of this main idea? 
or did it evolve in a different direction based on how it was received so widely and, and publicly? And, uh, you know, at first it's in his head and then it's out there and he's responding to it. So, Jonathan, can you speak a little bit to, to that experience post-publication? Well, thank you, Zach. Yeah, well, well, Persig does write about how, like all writers, he hoped for millions of copies and adulation and all the rest of it. Um, and that's what came his way, although he didn't um, maybe know quite what to do with it because he is quite reclusive. And um, For example, I believe um, because the book was so successful, lots of filmmakers in Hollywood wanted to turn it into a movie. You can imagine this great movie, right? There's relationships, there's there's rich material. Um, and Robert Redford was going to play Persig, so I'm told. I, was, well, I can't remember where I read this, but this is, uh, I believe, credible rather than just something I picked up on the hop. Um, and Persig turned it down um, because he felt that ultimately they would spoil the book. Um, a kind of purist in that sense. He felt that they would harm it. Now, interestingly, with Netflix series these days, and with about almost 50 years going past since the book was published, um, who knows what the rights are like and Persig's dead now, and maybe someone will make a movie out of this one day. Anyway, to come back to your question about what happened next, I think Lila was a good 20 odd years later. I don't, I have to check the dates, but it was a while later. Um, and I think as is often the case with these things, the first year or two or three was kind of just responding to feedback on the book, um, probably resting quite a bit, um, changing his life, no doubt. There was also a, a, the birth of a child, which is mentioned at the end of the first book, after Chris died. Uh, they were quite old, you know, for having kids relatively old um, and were considering not having the child. And then the last minute chose to, and the, the final words of the book are actually their newborn child typing random keys. So there's lots of sweet notes in it. Um, in terms of Lila, um, my general feeling about that book is that it's philosophically deeper, but um, less, less enchanting, less readable. Um, it's a book about, rather than a motorcycle journey, it's more like a boat journey. And instead of a relationship with his son, Chris, he has a troubled relationship with, um, I forget her name now, but there's a female character that he meets randomly in a bar um, who's a bit wayward and, you know, has problems with drugs and alcohol and they make outs and he describes all of that. But then somehow he's all about, does this person have quality? Oh, she's called Lila, the book's title. She's Lila. Um, does Lila have quality? And um, he, the, the story is not, it feels in that case more like he had a philosophical theory to develop. So he wanted to build on what happened in the first book. And he works very hard to develop that theory. And there is a whole community, like I say, of, of academics and you know, quasi-academics trying to make sense of this metaphysics of quality that Percy came up with. Um, but the book itself, I would say, whereas the first book is like really is a story of a self-inquiry with rich relationships that really matter to him. And the philosophy kind of pours out of that as a pattern of a larger who am I discourse. And where are we at this point in time? Light has a bit more, here's a very intricate philosophical system for those who want an intricate philosophical system. And because I need to sell um, a book in a similar genre to, to the first book, I need to bring in some narrative. Now the narrative isn't bad by, by most standards, but the first book was brilliantly written, I think. I mean. As someone who struggles with writing myself, it has a lucidity and a clarity and a sort of, you know, that kind of capacity to tell things how they are directly without, you know, straight from the self somehow, without too much, too much flower power behind it, but just things as they are, one sentence after the other, clear and lucid as you go. Very difficult to write like that, but he managed it in the first case. In the second book, uh, it... It's all relative, right? Lila by itself, really good, but it's not the same class as the first, I think, as a book. As a philosophy, it's deeper. It, it does go into more depth to unpack what this quality thing is all about. And by the way, just as a one-liner, it's a good one-liner in person, so it's worth sharing. He's, the whole book, a bit like the first book, trying to grapple with quality, he's still trying to grapple with that question in the second book. And it comes back to, you know, quality sometimes becomes values, 
and and value something's become goodness and, and there's you know there's a few of these terms that are almost interchangeable and at the end he describes a scene in which someone appears with a fairly nondescript looking dog and the person there is not quite sure what kind of dog this is and so he asks the owner who happens to be i think native american says what kind of a dog is that and the person looks a bit puzzled and says it's a good dog and Persig says, that was it. That's what I've been trying to write about all this time. All these books, all these years, good is a noun, he said. And um, although you can't reduce the metaphysics of quality to a word, good is a noun, you know, as opposed to an adjective. It's like you perceive it directly in the world. That's a good dog. Every time I see a dog in the park, I think of that line. And so if the book was good for nothing else, it was definitely good for that insight. Um, and he calls that the Homer that you know uses American baseball language about hitting out of the park or something. That good as a noun encapsulates his latter philosophy. Awesome. Um, in a second, we're going to come to Tom Big Bane's question. You've got a choice of two there, Tom. But Jonathan, I know you've put a lot of um, thought to this uh, event, and so I, I want to make sure that you have an opportunity. To, to make sure you don't um, leave not saying something that you wanted to, to get out. So, um, well, I wonder. thank you, Dave. No, thank you. Very gracious of you. And um, I, I've already been glad to say quite a lot. So thanks a lot for the chance and for the questions. I think the only thing I might add is that, you know, he Percy was writing at a particular point in time, um, give or take, you know, pretty much 50 years ago. Um, and it, was, it wasn't pre-climate change, but it was pre-knowledge of climate change, certainly pre-knowledge pre of any sense of incipient ecological collapse. It was also um, a time of counterculture resisting consumerism, but it was sort of pre-globalization in many ways. So I suppose the interesting question is, um, to really think of what Persig would mean in this globalized, digitalized world we're in now, and the kind of not even modern condition that Persig was dealing with. He was kind of pre-postmodern in many ways. And now we're in a kind of meta-modern world where we're trying to somehow carve something new out of the failures of modernism and the kind of uh, critiques of postmodernism that don't kind of provide any substantive vision for how we should live in the future. I would say in that context, Persic has still got something perennial to offer that isn't about historical stages, um, but is still relevant to today because he's speaking about a, percept a sort of deep perception into how things are that can put you in the right relationship with reality, regardless of whether that's inside the mechanics of a motorcycle or whether you're on top of a mountain looking over a great vista. It's somehow the same mode of perception that we're after. And it's precious regardless of the times. But I feel today, especially when there's a miasma of misinformation and we're digitally addicted and we're on a kind of treadmill that we can't get off of repeated you know, consumption and uh, an economic and political pattern that we don't seem to be able to shift, Percy would probably have something to say about seeing more clearly into the moment. Um, and I love... You know, I wonder, I mean, to be honest, I actually tried. I mean, it's very far from successful, but I, I wrote my own version, The Moves That Matter. And it wasn't Persig's book, but it was similar in the sense that I was trying to grapple with my own chess experience and try and make sense of the problems of the world as I saw them through that lens. I don't think I quite succeeded, um, but I hope someone does. I think we need a book of that nature. And it probably is a book and not a video with the greatest of respect to Rebel Wisdom. It probably is. Um, someone who takes the time to spend four or five years to really grapple with where we are and help us relearn and re-understand how to look at the world and relate to it correctly so that we don't squander our energy in culture war. We don't get completely addicted by the algorithms and the notifications and we do protect our one precious habitat. Somehow the message of Persig's book is attend to reality in the right way and that applies in 2021 as much as it applied in 74 or 68 when the trip took place. Um, so I just want to say that really, I think to read the book again today and ask, 
what does quality look like today in a in this context post covid enduring emergency of climate change digital world where is the buddha in the motorcycle in this context where is the buddha in the zoom room um, how do we sort of get back to that spirit of deep inquiry with reality that Percy would have us do? That's, you know, what I'd hope for. Mm. We've got time for one more question. I feel, Tom, that your second question is kind of almost directly related to what Jonathan just said. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much, Jonathan. I, I found what you've been saying, like, deeply inspiring. So I, I guess a very brief question, which you might not, have an answer to off the top of your head is what, what, what's a book that is similarly inspiring a contemporary book on philosophy that's beautifully written similarly inspiring is there one out there and actually i, I just want to before you answer that just say uh if Persig was writing the book now how would he write it differently aside from climate change but just sort of knowing what we know about the human brain and neurophysiology and genetics and 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 evolution uh, do, do you think he would have a different take on this split between objective and subjective and the, 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 the almost seemingly wider chasm that there is between sort of academic modernism and what the sort of sense-making uh, world uh, of Tao and, and spirituality and, and um experience you know there, there's a there's a widening rift it seems it hasn't been coming together so how would how would he have written the book differently in the current environment so there's two parts of that question the first is relatively easy um look there are many great books out there in terms of the the, the narrative spirit of someone describing what they're good at while also commenting on the culture at large I think Matthew Crawford's The Case for Working with Your Hands, as it's called in the UK. I think in the US, it's actually called Shop, shop Class as Soul Craft. I think very, you have a shop craft notion over there. Um, but it's got a different title, but it's Matthew Crawford. And it's similar in that Crawford's also saying, look, he was a motorcycle mechanic. He was also a political philosopher. And he moves between these worlds very seamlessly in the way the person does. And actually... Crawford wrote a review of Persig's book or something, not a review, but a kind of appraisal, I think when Persig died, saying that the, the need to be, in, to be unalienated or de-alienated even from technology has never been greater. And just to add a note there, it's really serious. Like I know people working for DeepMind, working on AI, and they really are getting to the point where the AI designers themselves, the techies themselves, don't always know what the AIs are doing you know, they, they, they design self-learning organisms and such self-learning machines in such a way. And, and they put in so many algorithms and so many evaluation functions and that they have this, what they call intellectual debt. Um, in other words, there's, there's so much in there that they don't understand because they have to put that much data in there to get this meaningful output, but then they're lost as to how it happened. So it's not a trivial request to become de-alienated or unalienated from technology, but it's called for, and I think Matthew Crawford is one of the best guides. For the deep philosophy, um, I, I honestly think, although it's now plugging a book we're publishing, Ian McGilchrist's next book, The Matter with Things, is quite Taoist in its heart, like, like Percy's book is. It also comes out with a lot of work on the sacred that um, is quite surprising in some ways, but very powerful. And it's, but it, it, unlike the motorcycle, it's grounded in neuroscience. So it's got that kind of techie side and it's got a very humanistic, artistic side as well. Um, and then lastly, how would person do it different today? Well, obviously I don't know, but um, the world has changed so much. Like it's, um, it's kind of staggering. Um, this conversation is wonderful. One of the many great things that have come our way, but doom scrolling for hours isn't so great. And nuclear hurricanes and forest fires um, and incipient floods everywhere on the coast are not so great. So I think Persig would be somewhere like where like people like Jonathan Haidt are now, but he would be like a maverick Jonathan Haidt. So he'd be sort of slightly less established, 
looking in and saying, you know, you guys need to see things from a larger perspective. But ultimately, Persig is a mystic. And so he wouldn't get too caught up in Republican this and Democrat that or Brexit this or, you know, whatever. It'd be more about see reality clearly and from that place start thinking of what, what it means personally, culturally, and societally, educationally, and maybe only then politically. Um, but yeah, that, I would be intrigued. I mean, having gone through this process to make sense of the book again, it really is a work of genius. Like, you know, like the culture bearing book, uh, maybe there's too much information in the world for it to be quite the same way today. But um, I would love to see something like that to make sense of where we're at. Um, yeah. Maybe one of us should write it. Awesome. Uh, thank you, Tom, for that question. And um, Jonathan, thank you so much. Really beautiful, lyrical um, explanation of the book. And I think your passion for it really comes through. And I think, yeah, I think that was really appreciated. Oh, that's a, great, everyone here. a great pleasure. Thanks a lot. Yeah. So as we traditionally do at the end of these calls, if everyone would like to unmute themselves and we'll say thank you and goodbye to Jonathan and see you at the next call next week. Thank Jonathan, you, Jonathan. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jonathan. Thanks, Jonathan. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you for watching all the way to the end. And if you'd like to join conversations like this, check out our digital campfire. You get access to a load of member-only films. You can watch live, ask questions, come to our book club, our wisdom gym sessions, and our regular monthly meetups where we share what's going on behind the scenes. And you can also connect with other Rebel Wisdom members. What's more, you can also get discounts on our courses like Sensemaking 101. Check out the link below and we'd love to see you soon.